Um, aloha, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, just a note, if you joined us, um, recently joined us, that uh, we are recording today's session. So if you would not like to not be recorded, please turn off your camera. So this is the fall 2021 GS Symposium, and today we have four presenters. As part of the GS degree requirement, every GS student must conduct a faculty mentored research experience, write a thesis, and publicly present their findings along with taking questions from an audience. And that's what we are doing today with the symposium. So today, uh, rules for today. So please keep your microphone muted. Please hold all chat um, comments until uh, the presenter has completed their presentation. After the completion of each uh, presentation, uh, this you, you can unmute and briefly congratulate uh, the presenter. And then after the, this brief congratulatory period, we'll move to the question and answer phase for the presenter. I will be moderating that uh, portion and you can either unmute your microphone to ask a question, raise your hand uh, in, in your window or enter a question uh, in the chat window. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So today, um, our first speaker is Olivia Hughes. Um, her mentor is Dr. Margaret McManus from the Oceanography Department. And Margaret will share a few words about Olivia. Thanks, Mike. And it's so wonderful to see some old friends online. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I first met Olivia in the fall of 2017. Uh, she was a freshman and she was coming from Mid-Pacific Institute. Um, and after we chatted, I decided I was going to hire Olivia to work as a student assistant to work with the Pacayus Wave Buoy Group. So Olivia started primarily analyzing the data and then we realized that she was a tremendous help in the field and a really great artist. She helped us to repaint our entire lab. Um, Olivia, over these four and a half years, has been on numerous uh, wave buoy deployments and recoveries. She's also helped with other uh, oceanographic projects in, in our lab. And she's been our, with our group since before the pandemic. Um, so we really had a long four and a half year experience together. We're very proud of the work she's done and we thank her for her dedication to the team. Today, Olivia will be talking about coastal wave patterns in the Hawaiian Islands in relation to significant climate events. So Olivia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Margaret. Okay. Oh, there we go. So as Margaret said, I'm Olivia Hughes, a GES major at UH Manoa. Uh, she's been an amazing mentor. I appreciate her so much. And as Margaret said, the subject of my thesis is on waves. The ocean is an immeasurably valuable resource to Hawaii, not only in terms of culture and the economy, but it's been the subject of endless scientific research. Waves have been a particular area of interest for researchers in Hawaii. But I wanted to see how we can use the Pacayus wave buoys to look at the big picture of how waves are behaving in Hawaii. What are they doing? How are they changing? And can we possibly use this information to predict how waves will behave in the future, especially when we consider global climate change and sea level rise? So Pacayus stands for Pacific Islands Ocean Observing System. This is a project that has wave buoys collecting data all over the Pacific Ocean but the focus of my work was on the nine buoys surrounding the Hawaiian Islands, as I've shown you here on this map with their serial numbers as well. These buoys measure significant wave height in meters, peak and average wave period in seconds, peak wave direction in degrees, and sea surface water temperature in degrees Celsius. Data is collected every 0.78 seconds and is averaged over every 30 minutes. Uh, so here I have a rough schematic of the wave buoy mooring when we deploy them out in the ocean. At the bottom of the seafloor, we have our big heavy chain that acts as our mooring weight and anchor. Directly above, we have our acoustic release and two floater buoys uh, to keep everything from getting too tangled and to also make sure that we have minimal uh, waste at the bottom of the seafloor. 
At the center of our line, we have some balancing weights and near the hull, we have our very thick rubber cord. Uh, this is just to protect the hull of the buoy and to keep it from getting cut off of its line and drifting too far away from its deployment site. Uh, the setup is designed to allow the buoy to get pushed around by the waves a little bit without going underwater or getting damaged. So these are the methods that Pack Ice uses to uh, define its parameters. Significant wave height is the mean wave height of the highest one third or 33% of all waves passing the buoy point. Sea surface temperature is self-explanatory. It's the temperature of the sea surface water in degrees Celsius. Wave period is the duration for one full wavelength, so crest to crest, to pass the buoy point. Peak wave direction uh, wave period is only associated with the waves of maximum energy in a sample period. And likewise, average wave period is only associated with waves of average energy in a given sample period. Peak wave direction is the direction in which the peak sea surface waves are traveling from. Again, they're only associated with the highest energy waves in a given sample period. And wave direction is always expressed in compass degrees from true north. So here we see a timeline of all the available data from the Hawaii buoys. This is just to illustrate that some of these buoys have been in the water for a lot longer than others, and they'll thus have a much larger amount of data to observe and derive patterns from. In terms of, driving, of finding patterns in the wave buoy data, it was important for me to think about seasonality, but seasons in areas near the equator like Hawaii are not necessarily like the seasons you would experience uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, Hawaii has two major seasons, Kau and Ho'oilo. They each run for approximately half the year, respectively. Kau is the hot and dry season that runs from May to October, and Ho'oilo is the cool and rainy season that runs from November to April. So using that information, when we look at peak wave direction, what can we find? I'll first show you an example of a North Shore buoy. I chose Mokapu because this is our oldest Hawaii buoy and it has the largest amount of data to observe. What you see on the right side of this slide is called a wave rose plot, uh, and this is showing you the direction that the waves are coming from when they hit the buoy. All of these points are sitting on top of a compass with north on the top, south on the bottom, west and east on the left and right. As you can see, the waves at this location range mainly from the north to the east. This buoy isn't getting any southern or western waves. Now this is the direction data from all of the waves that have ever hit this buoy. However, when we break this data up into seasons, we find some interesting patterns. What you see here are two histograms, one for each season, of wave direction versus wave frequency at the Mokapu buoy. As you can see, in both seasons, range, waves range from the northwest to a few hitting in the southeast. However, you'll notice that you see a shift in the frequency of waves incoming from the north and northeast during Ko, and a more balanced range of wave directions during Ho'uilo. This is a pattern that we saw in all of the North Shore buoys. We saw an increase in frequency of north and northeastern waves in Ko, and a wider range of wave directions in Ho'uilo. In contrast, when we look at a south shore buoy like Barber's Point, it's not going to get those northeastern waves because of the shoreline just to the northeast of the buoy. As you can see on the wave rose plot, waves at this buoy range all the way from the northeast to the south, uh, northwest to the southeast, I apologize. So where are these waves coming from when, they break them, when we break them up into seasons? As you can see in the two Barber's Point histograms, during Ho'uilo, waves are mainly coming from the northwest, and during Kao, waves are incoming almost exclusively from the southwest, so almost the opposite of what we're seeing in the uh, north shore buoys. Moving on to some significant sea surface temperature findings. All of the buoys that were deployed between 2011 and 2015 recorded an upward trend in sea surface temperature. This tells me that there is consistency among all of the buoys and that this increase in sea surface temperature was a region-wide increase. Four out of the nine buoys recorded a maximum sea surface temperature within the first two weeks of September of 2015. What could have caused this? The timing of this temperature spike coincides almost perfectly with the 2015-2016 El Nino event. This was a particularly famous El Nino because at its peak in November of 2015, the sea surface temperature anomaly recorded by NOAA was 3 degrees Celsius, beating the previous El Nino record of 2.6 degrees Celsius in 1984. Another potential source of this heat spike that is possibly related to the El Nino is a phenomenon called a marine heat wave. Marine heat waves were, um, there were multiple marine heat waves in 20, 2015, uh, particularly the Northeast Pacific blob being the most famous one. Uh, the blob did span over a multitude of years, um, but it was first documented in 2015. It's also good to note that on the surface in Hawaii, we were also experiencing a heat wave. Temperatures in Hawaii from July through October of 2015 were an average of 1.5 degrees Celsius higher than mean monthly temperatures during that time. All of this tells me is that we're seeing a regional sea surface temperature spike during a particular point of this year, and we can very reasonably relate this regional event to global climate events. 
onto some significant wave height findings. Seven out of the nine Hawaii buoys recorded a maximum wave height in 2019, and of those seven, four of them recorded a maximum wave height specifically in February 11th of 2019. This can very likely be attributed to a large weather system that hit the Hawaiian Islands between February 10th and 11th of 2019. And this was a massive storm. It was believed to have been caused by a shift in the polar jet stream, and it spanned all the way from the northwest coast of the mainland to the Hawaiian Islands. At its peak, the National Weather Service reported waves of up to 18 meters in height north of Kauai and Oahu. When we look at just the North Shore buoys, Northern shores are known to get very big southern uh, swell, uh, northern swell, I'm sorry, during Ho'uilo, particularly during the winter months of December and January. And this was seen in all of the North Shore buoys. We saw increases in average sea surface, uh, I apologize, wave height during winter and lower wave heights during the summer, particularly at Hanalei, Kauai. This had the largest range of recorded wave heights during Ho'uilo. It's likely because geographically, Kauai is the northernmost island and so the Hanalei buoy is the first to get hit with that really massive winter swell. Alternatively, when we look at the South Shore buoys, this data is a little bit more complexing. South facing shores are known to get swelled during Kau, particularly during the summer months of July and August. However, the Barbers Point buoy showed some slightly higher average wave heights during Ho'uilo. It behaved a little bit more like a North Shore buoy. And this is likely because, as I mentioned before, Barbers Point gets a lot of uh, northwestern waves during the winter time. But the Lanai Southwest and Pearl Harbor buoys showed no discernible seasonal wave height differences. What could have caused this? I believe that the Lanai and Pearl Harbor buoys are not necessarily at optimal locations to be uh, reading accurate southern wave data for different reasons. The Pearl Harbor buoy is deployed in 30 meters of water depth at the entrance to the Pearl Harbor Channel. So it's likely that all larger waves have already broken offshore and the remaining short period waves that do hit the buoy are just being steered by the channel. And therefore, this buoy is not necessarily representing actual wave information from Oahu Southern Shores. Conversely, the Lanai buoy, it's a lot like the Barber's Point buoy. It's receiving a significant amount of swell from the Northwest. And therefore, since swell is not exclusively incoming from the South, the data is just sort of getting buried. Nonetheless, what can we conclude from all of this? The buoys in Hawaii that have long-term data, they're showing trends, they're showing patterns. We can pinpoint sp specific areas in the data and relate them to global scale climate events. The bottom line is that the longer these wave buoys are recording data in the water and sending that information back to us, the clearer the picture is going to be. These wave buoys have a lot of short-term value in the meantime. There are teams at Pakeus that are dedicated to making short-term wave forecasts based on the wave data that we receive. And these buoys are also uh, updating their data live to the Pakeus website that you can see in increments of up to 30 days. This can do a lot for public safety by informing people about what waves are doing right now and what they might be doing in the near future. These buoys also have a lot of potential to augment global scale satellite data. A good example of this are the NOAA Coral Reef Watch or CRW1 satellites. These satellites measure sea surface temperature data on a global scale, and this is very valuable information. But the accuracy of this data really starts to taper off the closer you get to a shoreline. In this way, the sea surface temperature data from the Pacayus buoys could help to augment that data and give us a very clear picture of what sea surface temperature looks like specifically around Hawaii. So with all that said, I would like to thank everyone on the Pacayus team for working with me all these years. Of course, Margaret McManus, but also Christina Comfort, Kibble Milliken, Andrea Kuyama, Sean Riston, and Jim Patemra. I think most of them are here today. And all of my family and friends for supporting me all these years. Are there any questions? Olivia, please feel free to unmute if you would like to congratulate Olivia on her presentation. Good job, Olivia. Olivia. Good job, Olivia. Nice job. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and we will take uh, questions now. So either unmute and ask, or you can uh, drop the question in the chat, or you can raise your hand. Okay, Olivia, I have a question for you. Okay. You mentioned right at the start that uh, these buoys collect data at intervals of 0.78 seconds. Why 0.78 seconds? That is the most data we could collect without completely overwhelming our computers, basically. We tried to have the, our buoys collect as much data as possible without it being too dense uh, to work with. Um, but yeah, the, the data is collected every 0.78 seconds, 
And after every 30 minutes, all that data is averaged. And that is a single point of data uh, to be read by um, our CDIP sensors. Well, I was just curious. I mean, two significant figures. What, what about 0.79 or, you know, why was it, it was, 0.78? I think 0.78 is equal to two hertz of data. I think Kimball might be able to confirm that for me if he's here. Um, but that is simply the frequency of data that we could record without it overwhelming our computers, basically. Okay, so it's for practical purposes. Uh, it also helps to save battery life on the buoys as well. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. that's practical. Okay, I have another question. Have you ever seen a very old video called Waves Across the Pacific? I have not. I need to okay, look that, I'm sure that's or... in the UH library and it's worth looking at. It's um, a video about waves that were generated in the Southern Ocean and propagated all the way across the Pacific Ocean and eventually arrived in Alaska. But you can imagine that there was a station in the Hawaiian Islands that monitored the passage of these waves. And I would assume that's you know part of what you're getting uh, in the summertime, breaking on the South Shore. Probably, I think I will definitely watch that. That sounds very interesting. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, it is, it's, it's worth taking a look at. Thank you so much. All right, good job. Hey Olivia, oh. this is this is Jim. Um, Hi Jim. I think um, I mean that, that's that's very bold after uh, thank, thanking Margaret and her team for uh, putting the buoys in and then saying that maybe one of them was in the wrong place. Do you know why the the Pearl Harbor? I'm just kidding, of course. Why the Pearl Harbor buoy is where it is? That um, from my understanding, the placement of that buoy was dictated by the U.S. Navy. Uh, that was where they wanted the buoy placed so they could monitor. Um, probably wave information in the channel because that's where all their ships are coming in and out of. I, if I had it my way, I would move it because I question, yeah, if that data is valuable. I'm, I'm not sure what they were looking for specifically, but I know that they wanted it in the channel just to look at wave information and data just to, for insurance for their boats coming in and out of the harbor, basically. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, Olivia. Uh, I'm Rick Shima. A very interesting uh, uh, report. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Barber's Point. There's um, another archived buoy, um, but I, I think you use the current buoy. Is that correct? That's in commission right now? Yes, it is. Um, okay. Uh, I believe that has two years of data. And the decommissioned buoy has about seven. Um, so was any research done on uh, using that data so we have more um, sampling times? And I have another question about uh, wave fights. Uh, okay, sure. Well, the Barber's Point uh, buoy was first and foremost moved because it kept getting hit. It was getting too expensive to keep that going and it was dangerous. Um, so I have only used the information from the Barber's Point that started going out in 2017. I have not downloaded the archived data. Um, that could be added in future research, I think. I believe they're, you know, they're measuring the same parameters. So it would be plausible to use that data in the future, yes. Yes, because I, I just did a, a wave study of Barber's Point and used both of those uh, data, uh, wave height, um, energy spectrum, and direction. And uh, uh, it was interesting to see, there wasn't that whole heck of a lot of difference, but it still adds to the historical database. Right. So uh, just uh, offer that as a suggestion. Um, and regarding wave heights uh, and uh, wave direction. So when you have your, um, when you presented the, the wave direction um, spectrum, um, was that related to wave heights at all? Or does that, was that strictly just wave heights regardless of, of, I mean, was that just wave direction regardless of how high the wave was? On the histograms or the wave rose plot? The, 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 the spectrum. The, the, the spectrograms, the spectrum plot. Yes, they yes. were not related to wave heights data. They're only looking at the, the direction of waves related to how many hits the buoy got. 
So that, okay. that is why the y-axis was not averaged across the buoys. It's, it's only in relation to wave direction versus how many waves. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we have a question in the chat window. I'll read it for you. Um, oh. Did you notice any long-term trend in average wave height or uh, increase or decrease? No long-term trends. Like I'm not seeing an overall increase or decrease in wave height in any of the buoys. Really, wave height was, all the patterns I saw were related to seasonality. Uh, there were some trends, like I mentioned, in sea surface temperature from 2011 to 2015, but that was the only long-term increase or decrease in any of the long-term data. Oh yeah, you're welcome, Andrew. One more question, if there is one. If not, uh, great job, Olivia. Well done. Thank you so much. We'll now move on to our next speaker, uh, who is Shannon Murphy. Uh, Shannon's mentor is Dr. Kule Rogers from the Hawaii Institute for Marine Biology. And Dr. Kule will now share a few words about Shannon. Okay, hey, I'm pleased to introduce Shannon Murphy. She was born and raised in Honolulu. Her love of the ocean and involvement in environmental activism in high school brought her to the University of Hawaii to study global environmental science in 2018. She was also selected as a recipient this summer for the Noah Holling Scholarship. Shannon's enthusiasm for coral reef ecology has been evident in her volunteer efforts with the Friends of Panama Bay, where she monitored corals. And then in October of 2020, she joined our coral reef ecology lab at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology to conduct her thesis at Hanama Bay during the COVID-19 closure. Her admirable, optimistic personality, dedication and work ethic make her a prime candidate to complete her goal to obtain a PhD in marine biology that will equip her for a future in pursuing ocean conservation. We've been really happy to have Shannon in our lab and take it away, Shannon. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Shannon Murphy and today I will be sharing my GES thesis advised by Dr. Kule Rogers and funded by the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program titled Assessing Human-Induced Coral Reef Disturbances from Visitors at Hanauma Bay Nature Preserve. I would like to begin with an overview of today's presentation, starting with the significance of Hanauma Bay and coral reefs, followed by my research objectives, methodology, discussion of results, and what this means for future management of the bay. Hanauma Bay is a 101-acre nature preserve located in East Honolulu on Oahu. This area has a history of recreational use by Hawaiian nobility dating back to the 1800s. Hanauma Bay was purchased from the Bishop Estate by the city and county of Honolulu around 1930, which is the same time frame as the photograph on the left. In 1967, it was established as a marine life conservation district, which prohibited the taking of marine life, shells, rocks, and sand. Hanauma Bay is the most popular snorkeling location on the island, with 3,300 daily visitors before COVID-19. However, the high visitor occupancy may impair the health and well-being of aquatic organisms, including coral reefs. Corals are unique holobionts with many symbioses, including a rich microbiome and dinoflagellates called zooxanthellae that support up to 95% of the coral host nutrition. Unfortunately, corals are vulnerable to global and regional scale stressors, such as warming sea surface temperatures, ocean acidification, pollutants, and fishing pressure. The local stressor for this research is physical contact with the reef as seen in the top right image. 
The cultural, economic, and ecological significance of Hanauma Bay makes this an important region of study. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Hanauma Bay was closed from March until December 2020. This was a unique opportunity to allow the wildlife in the bay to experience a time frame without human contact. I had two research goals. One was to quantify the number of snorkelers and contributing physical contacts to the reef upon the reopening of the bay. And the second was to examine corresponding changes in corals, such as new lesions, abrasions, or coral breakage due to snorkeling activity. The coral used in the research was Posipora meandrina or cauliflower coral. This coral was selected since it is one of the only remaining common coral species on the inside reef of the bay. Now onto the methods. Hanauma Bay can be broken down into four sections, but data collection was only on the east side in Backdoor and Keyhole Lagoon. These two regions are popular water entry points and have similar substrate depth and spatial complexity. I designated five stations, each five by five meters to compare visitor activity and reef disturbances in the near shore plots of two and four versus the far shore reef of one and three. Plot five is a reference for coral health in regions below human reach, meaning the corals are a few meters deep and plot five was not regularly viewed throughout the data collection. I took data bi-monthly for nine months and each station was surveyed for 30 minutes where I recorded the number of people swimming through the plot and I observed their behavior with a substratum. I tallied reef interactions based on categories of standing, sitting, grabbing, kicking, and body grazing to all types of reef substrata. And that includes bare rock, algae, crustose coralline algae, and dead and living coral. After the survey, photos were taken of Posipora meandrina in the plots. Ideally, each plot would have the same number of corals for the research, but the two far shore plots had seven corals each, plot four had one coral, and plot two had zero corals. Man many of the corals on the inside reef are gone at this point. So corals in plots one, three, and four had a time series of 18 photos over nine months. An open source program was used to calculate surface area of the coral for each photo and to indicate coral tissue growth or loss. An example is here. A lock was used as a reference scale for measuring surface area and only the living tissue was used in the calculations and regions of um, dead tissue like this middle section were subtracted. An important part of the research was deciphering between natural and anthropogenic reef disturbances. The two images on the left and the two in the middle are all caused by corallivores, um, burrowing organisms that create fissures or kahi crabs that create indentations with their pinchers as seen in that bottom middle photo. The two um, images on the right are damage inflicted by humans. There is irregular coral breakage in this photo, you can see a coral branch dislodged from the colony. My resulting figure is comparing plot location on the x-axis to the frequency of disturbance on the y-axis split into categories of reef contacts in the colored bars. The reef contacts include all types of reef substrata, including corals. However, less than five of the corals or the contacts were directly to a coral colony. Plot four had the highest visitor and reef disturbances, which makes sense because this is a key water entry point. And overall, there was a total of 327 snorkelers and 168 reef disturbances, which is about a ratio of one disturbance for every two snorkelers. Grabbing was the most common category of reef disturbance, followed by standing. And I observed grabbing as a method to move across the reef um, without scraping your knees or your legs, especially at low tide. I'd like to demonstrate that although plot four had the highest um, frequency of disturbance, the proportion of visitors contributing a reef disturbance was highest for the two far shore plots. 
In other words, for snorkelers who entered those regions, there was a higher percentage that they contacted the reef in one way or another. And I believe this is due to strong currents or higher turbidity in the far shore reef. This figure demonstrates the change in coral tissue surface area from the first and the last survey. The x-axis shows 10 corals and the y-axis is the change in surface area. The coral results show there was no evidence of coral breakage, lesions, or abrasions from snorkelers. However, most corals decreased in surface area, which is represented in the red bars or um, tissue loss. A few corals remained relatively the same and coral L in the blue bar is the only one that grew according to the surface area measurements. I did monitor a total of 15 corals, but some of the surface area measurements were unavailable due to photographic error. Now I'm gonna show some specific examples of tissue loss. This is coral H in plot three, which degraded over the entire nine month period. The cause of the tissue loss in the photo is unknown. Similarly, coral C in plot one lost tissue during the fourth survey back in February. A single coral branch um, discolored to a light gray for no observable reason and then proceeded to die. And the tissue surrounding that one branch also, um, also died. Another incident is for coral J in plot three. Um, this coral was found bleached between the end of May and the beginning of June. Around this time, there were extreme tidal changes and the top of the coral surface could have been exposed to strong sunlight or the tissue was near the water's edge, which is the suspected cause of bleaching. Two weeks after discovering the bleaching, turf algae infiltrated and the top tissue remained dead. This was the only coral to bleach, um, possibly due to genetic differences or symbiotic clades that are more resilient to temperature or bleaching. And the last example for tissue loss is coral K in plot three, which developed algal specks throughout the survey period. Maybe difficult to tell in the picture, but there are about 10 sections of algae settlement and the cause and the species of algae is also unknown. Based on literature and my results, reef disturbances are a product of poor snorkeling technique. Less than 3% of the reef contacts were directly to a living coral colony, but this could be explained by the relatively low coral cover um, in the bay. For example, plot four has coral cover of less than 1%. So the chances of contacting another substratum are much higher. Additionally, my data only reflects 2.3% of the time Hanauma Bay was open during the nine months of research, so disturbances are likely to be much higher. And another category of reef disturbance that is significant to coral reef health is sedimentation via sand resuspension from snorkelers kicking. This is a significant aspect because Sedimentation can inhibit reproduction, growth, and coral recruitment. Visitors are playing a large role in Hanauma Bay sedimentation because data shows that the bay was 5.9 meters more clear during the COVID closure than during public days. And lastly, it was difficult to assess coral health and the causation for tissue death since many corals had pre-existing dead branches, tissue discoloration, heavy sediment load, and algal growth. One specific example of a pre-existing condition is bright pink pigmentations on multiple corals throughout the bay. Here are three examples where you can see pink coloration and this was present throughout the nine months. I do not have the opportunity today to get into the details, but this is very interesting. Um, pink pigmentation is an indication of coral stress. The pink could be a product of pink line syndrome, a coral disease induced by a cyanobacteria and fungi, or the coloration could be the expression of chromoproteins in the absence of zooxanthellae. In either case, corals um, that show the pink may be vulnerable to bleaching or other means of tissue loss. And in conclusion, 
My first point is that physical touch to the substrata may inhibit coral growth, reproduction, and larval settlement. Two, tissue loss occurred for corals in all plots, and corals displayed symptoms of stress. Physical touch is only one of the possibilities. I'm going to jump ahead to the outer reef corals. Um, as you can see, they all have degraded tissue covered in sediment, maybe some other pollutants, sunscreens, predation, or um, high bacteria levels or some plausible reasons for tissue loss. Three, it is critical to investigate coral recruitment studies and causes for tissue loss using molecular techniques. Ultimately, if corals are not gaining surface area and if they are not reproducing, it is a matter of time before more corals diminish, leading to ecological and economic consequences. So that being said, from four, managers should take preventative measures such as limiting the daily visitor capacity, prohibit snorkeling over the reef at low tide and during times of rough ocean conditions, and increase the education on coral colony growth, physical contact, and coral recruits. Possipora meandrina is a candidate on the Endangered Species Act, and it is important to control human impacts in Hanauma Bay and the rest of the island. And I would like to say thank you to everyone on this list and a very special thanks to Dr. Kuule Rogers for advising me and being an incredible mentor. And thank you to Europe for project funding. And thank you all in the audience for listening. I am happy to take any questions. Bob Shannon, feel free to unmute and congratulate her. Great job, Shannon. Good job, Shannon. Good job, Shannon. Good job, Shannon. Good job. Good job. <laughs> Nicely done. Great job. Thank you. We have time for questions. Okay, Shannon, I have a question. Um, what are okay. visitors told uh, when they when they come to Anama Bay? Are they given any guidance about what to do and not to do? Yeah, so um Right when they, after they get their tickets, there's a little waiting period before they watch a video. The, as of 2002, um, the video is required to watch. So sometimes some of the um, education team, they kind of go over, you know, don't touch the reef. But um, the education video does say that corals are living animals and that they should be avoided. Do not, uh, t you know, touch the reef. But I just think that we, we need to emphasize it maybe in different ways. And um, I believe that when, when snorkelers are down there, um, because it's difficult to tell that um, it is a living reef because many corals are gone. They are kind of just looking at bare substratum. It kind of looks like rock. And so if we can just explain more about what corals do, their significance, um, how touching the reef can really impact coral recruits, I think those are pieces of information that are missing and that tourists um, should be aware of. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, next with uh, Chip and then followed by Jeff. Hey, Shannon, that was a great talk. Um, there's you. a geologic backdrop or context to uh, a lot of the dead limestone that's in the inner region. And uh, our hypothesis is that there was a higher sea level 3,000 years ago that, that fell. And a lot of those inner corals died because they lost the accommodation space and the water became very shallow and warm and inimicable. Um, and there was a general migration of the, the accretion center sort of out to the front of the, that old fringing reef. And that's where mm -hmm. a lot of the diversity is now. I've put um, in the chat a link to a, sort of a summary chapter that we wrote about this. Um, awesome. And I just wanted to provide that to you just for some geologic background. Yes, great that talk. is so great. Thank you great so job. much. Um, Shannon, I just had a, a question. You, I think you mentioned predation just briefly once, and I was curious how often you, know, you saw parrotfish scars on the corals. There certainly are far more parrotfish in Hanama Bay than there are in a number of neighboring reef environments. 
Yeah, I, I definitely witnessed it almost every time I took data collection. Um, and it wasn't just the parrotfish. It was a lot of the um, like butterfly uh, fish that also um, predated on the reef as well. And um, a lot of my initial pictures from my first survey, so right when the bay was um, opening and it was closed for nine months, there were, I, I noticed fish bites on every single coral colony and there was probably about like, you know, two to 10 different sections where they're really eating the reef, so. Thanks, nice job. Thank you. Ken, we have uh, two questions in the chat. I'll read the first one. Um, this is from Lori. I was wondering how you chose this methodology. Was it related to how other human impact studies have been conducted? As well, if you could touch on if some of the plots were meant to be controls. Mm. Yeah, so ideally my, my first idea for the methods was to have one plot um, for the four sections across the bay. But when we went out there looking um, at the reef, the um, the west side of the bay in closer to Witch's Brew, the reef formation was very different and I couldn't really find a whole lot of um, cauliflower corals. And so to just kind of keep the methods more consistent, that's when I decided to change the project to comparing the near shore versus the far shore reef. Um, and the Keyhole Lagoon and Backdoor Lagoon are pretty similar with a reef shelf um, separated by sandy patches. And so it was just a, a better way to have more consistency in the data collection. And the comment about the controls, um, it, I didn't want to use the word control. I wanted to use it more of a reference for the outer shore plots because I wasn't able to go to the outer reef. Um, often because the conditions were just very rough and most of the time there were um, lifeguards surfing out there. So I didn't really want to go venture to the, the outside very often. Um, I suppose you can touch on the plots when it to be controlled. Experience low to no pressure. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to show some pictures, um, get an idea of like what the corals looked like on the outside of the reef, um, closest to the shore, but still in regions that were, were below, um, below human touch. So it's just another testament that there's a lot going on in the bay and um, it's not only physical touch that is affecting um, tissue growth and loss. And last question um, from Nicholas Yoss. Do you think adding a survey testing knowledge after the educational video would be helpful in making sure visitors know the area better? Yeah, that would be really great. I mean, I don't want it to be like an admission exam, but <laughs> I really do think that- It might be good. You know, <laughs> Panama Bay is, you know, it's not Disneyland. It's a nature preserve. It should be respected. And I think um, if we can have a more interactive um, experience with tourists and they can really understand the ecological significance, that's going to be the most important aspect. So um, for them just to learn more and for us to share, that's that's the biggest goal. Could economize it, create a whole test prep industry out of that. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Shannon. Great Thank job. You. Our next speaker, Henrik Weiberg. Uh, his mentor is Dr. Craig Smith from the Oceanography Department. Dr. Smith will now share a few words about Henrik. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce and to advise Henrik um, for his GES senior research. Henrik came to us at UH from Seattle in the fall of 2018, and he's been working on his research in my lab for the last two years and also doing very well in the GES program. Um, Hen Henrik is a remarkable student in person for a variety of ways, and you can get an idea from some of the highlights of his career at UH. They include making the UH sailing team, even though he did not know how to sail. He does know how to sail now. Um, he wrote a successful proposal for funding for his research to UROP. He participated in two, as a scientist and a, a great asset on two oceanographic cruises off Hawaii and off California, in which he collected data for his GES thesis. This allowed him to compare his experience on research cruises 
with that on fishing vessels during his summer job in Alaska. And I think he prefers the research cruises, but you can ask him that directly. And he also participated in UH's study abroad program at the University of Otago during the height of the pandemic. And as we all, knew, all know, New Zealand was probably a good place to be during the pandemic. So he chose his uh, study abroad program wisely. And really another uh, highlight of his career is completing his GS senior thesis on the abundance and diversity of megafauna at station Aloha. And he will now tell you about this. So take it away, Henrik. All right, hello everybody. Um, let me get in presentation mode. Okay. Uh, hi, thank you for being here. I'm Henrik. Uh, that was my mentor, Dr. Craig Smith. Thank you, Craig. And um, today I'm going to discuss the abundance and diversity of benthic megafauna at the Abyssal Station Aloha. So uh, what we're going to be going over today is I'm going to start by introducing the deep ocean, and then I'm going to go into site descriptions, question and a hypothesis, methods, station aloha community structure, comparison across North Pacific sites, and then finally some concluding points. Um, so just to introduce the deep ocean a little bit, uh, it's the largest known biome on the planet, but uh, ecosystem dynamics here remain predominantly unknown. And this is due to uh, extreme uh, high pressures and low temperatures and lack of light and distance from uh, the surface of our planet. Uh, and uh, my study focuses on the abyssal region, the abyssal plain region of uh, the deep ocean, uh, which is relatively flat uh, on the sea floor and exists between four to six kilometers below the ocean surface. And we can see some organisms on the right that live uh, in the abyssal plain region at Station Aloha. Um, okay, so my study is focusing on megafauna um, and megafauna in the deep Pacific. And uh, so what are megafauna? They're organisms that uh, can be identified in imagery. Uh, we have two kinds of megafauna that we're focused on in this study, xenophyophores um, on the left, and which are in the kingdom of Rhizeria, and metazoan megafauna on the right, which are in the kingdom of animalia, or animals as we know them. Um, and most of these deep, so deep seafloor megafauna get their food from... Uh, particles that sink down from produ uh, primary production in surface waters. And um, deeper locations receive less food due to uh, more res longer residence time in the water column when pelagic organisms can get at this food. And uh, this food is going to be characterized as POC flux um, or particulate organic carbon flux or POC flux. And yeah, that's going to that's gonna be food availability for the basis of this study. Um, so my focus was on the megafaunal community of Station Aloha, which can be seen on uh, this map right here on the far left, just above Hawaii. And I compare it to seven other sites in the North Pacific, uh, seven other uh, benthic sites. And uh, one of them is off the coast of California, Station M, and six are down in the Clarion Clipperton zone uh, at the bottom of this map. So to introduce Station Aloha, it exists under the oligotrophic North Pacific gyre just north of Oahu. Um, it's about 4,700 meters below the surface and uh, the, the oligotrophy in the surface waters of this region lead to a pretty low POC flux of 1.36 grams carbon per meter squared per year. Um, and I also just wanna note that few benthic megafaunal uh, studies have occurred at this site. Um, Station M, however, off California is a very different site. Um, it's off the California coast, the eutrophic California coast. Um, this station is at a similar depth, about 4,100 meters below the surface, but uh, due to the significant upwelling that occurs here, um, there is significantly more primary production and uh, gives it a much higher POC flux at five grams carbon per meter squared per year. Um, and then I will also be comparing to the Clarion Clipperton zone or the CCZ. Uh, this is a massive region between Hawaii and Mexico. And this region is going to be, is, is being looked at for deep sea mining. Um, in this figure that we can see on the left, we can see uh, all of the colored boxes are areas that could be potentially mined in the near future. Um, and these mining practices are expected to have significant impacts on benthic ecosystems um, all around. Okay, so 
my research. So the question that I ask for my research is how does the benthic community, benthic megafaunal community of stational Oha compare to that of other deep sea sites in the North Pacific? And I hypothesize that the low POC flux of stational Oha will have a significant effect on megafaunal abundance and diversity. Um, so to get this information, we uh, had to collect photos at the seafloor. Uh, so we sent down ROV Luukai, which can be seen uh, in the image below deploying. And um, we sent down ROV Luukai to collect photos across a transect um, at the seafloor. And uh, these photos were shot with a downward facing camera in accordance with a similar study that occurred in the Western CCZ. Um, once we had images, uh, they were annotated using the VARS software and organisms were identified to the lowest taxonomic level possible. Um, poorly lit images were excluded and these can be, this can be viewed on that panel of images below. We have some good, uh, good lighting on the left and uh, bad lighting on the right. And you can see that you really can't see the seafloor in those images on the right. Um, and then uh, once, once these images were discarded, we collected the photo area for each image um, using parallel lasers mounted to the ROV. Um, and then we use that area to calculate the megafaunal abundance uh, for each photo. And then we averaged the abund all the abundances to obtain the station Aloha megafaunal uh, abundance uh, for the transect. And um, then we collected similar uh, community structure data and POC flux data from uh, other North Pacific sites um, via the literature. Okay, uh, so to get into my results of station Aloha a little bit, um, 260 organisms were observed across the transect as a whole. Uh, station Aloha had a relatively low uh, megafaunal abundance at 0.15 individuals per meter squared. And uh, we can kind of see the community structure by phylum on the, on the left uh, in this pie chart. We can see that three phyla really dominate the computed community here. And they are uh, foraminifera, which are, again, in the kingdom of Rhizaria, and cnidaria, and echinoderms. So to get into that a little bit more, uh, xenophyovores were the most dominant uh, megafauna across the transect, uh, making up 34% of the community. Uh, with Umbalula, uh, which is a Nidaria, as close second, making up 23%. Um, and then I also just want to note that 21 organisms of uh, this 260 that were collected um, remained unidentified, which is making up 8% of the community. Um, so now I'm going to go into the diversity a little bit. Um, echinoderms were the most diverse group at four morphotypes, um, but across the entire community, we saw 20 total morphotypes, um, and this can be seen in the blue curve in the figure below. Uh, and then you can see that there's also two other curves there, and these curves are statistical assess estimates of um, morphotype richness in the region. Um, and the Chow 1 curve, the red curve, estimates there are 32 morphotypes in the region, while the bootstrap curve estimates that there are 26 morphotypes existing within the region. Um, and as we can see, these curves are all rising, suggesting that uh, the, the region was potentially undersampled. Um, okay, so now uh, what I did next is I compared to the other sites in the Pacific. Uh, if we look at the figures on the left, we can see Station Aloha is the lefternmost station, and Station M is on the right, and um, there's a progression kind of approaching continental margins uh, between the other stations. So this, the stations that are more on the right are approaching continental margins. Um, and if we look at POC flux, uh, the top figure, we can see an increasing trend in POC flux as you approach the equatorial regions and co uh, continental margin regions um, with uh, eight, APEI7 and Station M having the greatest um, POC flux. And you can see a similar trend with metazoan megafauna. Uh, we see metazoan megafauna increasing as we approach continental margins. Um, but we do not see similar trends with uh, xenophyophore abundances. Uh, that, that figure on the bottom is a little bit more random. Um, okay, so what I did next is I compared POC flux with the abundances. So we have on this figure, we have POC flux as the x-axis and abundances on the y-axis. 
The blue X's represent metazoan megafauna, while the red or the orange triangles represent uh, xenophyophore abundance. Um, and we can see, uh, if you look at that blue line, there's a pretty strong positive correlation between metazoan megafaunal abundance and POC flux. Um, but the relationship between xenophyophore abundance and POC flux is much weaker based on that R squared value. And, and based on that R squared value, it's, it's actually statistically insignificant. Um, and then I'm just going to discuss a little bit of taxonomic richness between sites. Um, so we can see the number of morphotypes at each site. Uh, and at Station Aloha, Station Aloha had the lowest taxonomic richness at 20 morphotypes. Um, with the highest taxonomic richness being in the Eastern CCZ, especially APEI 6 and UK1. Um, and Station Aloha is most similar to those in the Western CCZ. Um, now, just to wrap up the discussion real quick, uh, metazoan megafaunal abundances had a strong relationship with POC flux across sites, but xenophyophore abundances did not appear to be related to either metazoan megafaunal abundance or POC flux. Um, and then also, I just want to acknowledge that there was a gap in POC flux values between station M and the other sites. I'm going to go back to that really quick. Uh, you can see that between POC flux 2 and 4, there are no sites. Therefore, uh, adding areas with more intermediate POC fluxes would improve this study. And uh, taxonomic richness curves at station Aloha indicate that the station was undersampled. Uh, therefore, more transects need, need to be taken uh, to fully characterize uh, the diversity of, of this site in this region. Um, and to conclude, my hypothesis was that the low POC flux at Station Aloha will have a significant effect on megafaunal abundance and diversity. And this hypothesis was supported in terms of metazoan megafaunal abundance. However, it was not supported in terms of xenophyophore abundance. Um, further transects should be taken at Station Aloha to better understand how it compares to other locations. And uh, this research really shows that uh, benthic abyssal, abyssal benthic ecosystems are not homogenous and they need to be better understood before significant deep sea mining occurs. And I would like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Craig Smith and the rest of the Smith Lab. Uh, undergraduate Research Opportunities, or UROP, for funding my project. Megan Putz, Sarah Bingo, Jeff Drazen, and the rest of the scientists who made my research possible. And these are my references. And thank you very much. Put on mute and congratulate. Yeah, Henry. On a nice Great talk. Job, Henry. Henry. Good job, Henrik. Great job, Henrik. Thanks, everybody. Questions now? Oh. Okay, am I up next or to introduce Eleanor? Uh, we're, we're taking questions first for Henrik. Oh, okay, sorry. I didn't. Yeah. Okay, ahead, Henrik, Lord. I have a question. Um, does anything eat these organisms? I mean, you mentioned what their source of food is. Is anybody eating them? Um, so they're the, the big organisms, uh, not so much to my knowledge. Um, there are scavengers at the seafloor, so definitely, um, you know, there are, there are sharks down there, but I think, I think those really big predators are just so rare that they might be insignificant. I, that would be something for me to look into more definitely. It seemed like it would be slim pickings if you were a predator down there, um, but I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, it, it is some slim pickings for predators. The, uh, the dynamic between predator and prey is actually much different down there because um, the organisms are quite scarce and quite small. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Henrik. Yeah. So, yeah, good job. Um, really good job. Well done. It's so cool to see all the, the images for all the sites. And you're mentioning that uh, the region for Station Aloha is undersampled, right? So I was curious if off the top of your head, you kind of like recall how does that compare to how much the other stations um, 
were sampled, like in terms of we had about 200 images, right, for Station yeah. Aloha, where the yeah. other ones, have they been sampled for over the years or, yeah, for yeah. thousands of images? Yeah, and that, that differs for every site too. So, um, so we had 500 images, over 500 images for Station Aloha. And um, the, for instance, the Station M study that I used, that had nine transects. We had the, the one transect and, um, and that, that one has occurred over, uh, studies at Station M have occurred over really significant time periods. It's been studied since 1989. Um, the sites in the CCZ, those are more recent uh, because deep sea mining has only been prevalent recently. And that's, that's what has uh, kind of encouraged studies to occur in that region. Um, so those, those have, don't have the same spatial scale, but um, they do have uh, definitely more, more transects. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Grayson. Yeah, sorry if you already said this, Henrik, but you, you know you you showed a pattern between POC flux and, and megafauna, but you didn't show a pattern with the xenophyophores. What what do you think is more important to xenophyophores, or what do you think is driving their variability and abundance? Yeah, well, um, you know, it's so we saw the xenophyophores primarily in the CCZ station M and station Aloha. Both had uh, not a lot of xenophyophores. Um, so, and what do we know about the CCZ is it's being looked at for deep sea mining, uh, presence of nodules. So maybe, maybe this presence of nodules would actually, uh, increase the abundance of xenophyophores potentially, uh, you know, something to be looked at more. I, I could do some more research on it, but yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Harry, good job. I, I had a question. Um, I mean, as you may know, we've got the uh, the cabled observatory at Station Aloha ACO, and you know we're always looking for um, different ways to make this facility useful. And I'm wondering if 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 there's a way that future studies like could build upon what you've done, but make use of you know we've got now a long time series of video and still imagery. Again, it's pointing at a certain spot, but it um, either the existing data or perhaps putting an instrument down on ACO that, that might help studies like this? Uh, yeah, definitely. So, so specifically, I think that would help for uh, mobile megafauna. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of megafauna down there. For instance, those xenophyophores and those uh, cnidaria, they were um, all sessile, so they can't they can't move around the seafloor. But you know, if you're if you're continuously looking at one site and seeing what's at the one site, then we could definitely get a better idea of the uh, community structure of mobile megafauna at Station Aloha. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions for Henrik? Well, Henrik, I have a, an observation. Uh, there's a paper published by Dave Carl et al. a couple of years ago looking at POC particles sinking down through the water column at Station Aloha. And the conclusion of the paper was that the nutritional value of these particles was just about zero by the time you got down to a depth of, I'll say, a thousand meters. Uh, it was just refractory carbon that remained. It, it might be worth um, taking a look at these particles that, that find their way to the bottom of the ocean and comparing their nutritional value at a place like Aloha versus some of these other sites. It, uh, it might be perhaps a more revealing comparison of food supply than just POC flux. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's a very good point. So I, I I believe that that's kind of my my thesis project was kind of under the greater scope of understanding that exact uh, kind of thing that you're bringing up there. Yeah, okay. Jeff's Jeff's research project. So, yeah, Ed, I, I guess I'll, I'll I'll jump in here. We're we're actually looking at the different size particles filtered in situ and also collected in sediment traps and looking at them isotopically and tracing how they are incorporated into metazones on, on the seafloor. So okay. that, that's sort of, Henrik's work is done under that broader umbrella. Okay, very good. I 
Bob Henrik. So we're going to move on to our final speaker, Eleanor Ewan. Uh, she's under the mentorship of Dr. Michael Roberts from the Economics Department. Michael, would you like to say a few words? Sure, sure. First, first of all, I apologize for bombing in there on Henrik because I, I came from another oral exam and came in midstream. Um, wasn't sure where things were at. Uh, so anyhow, I'm Michael Roberts. I'm in the economics department and also uh, have a 25% appointment in C grants. So I have some connection with you guys over there. Uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce Eleanor Yuan. Eleanor is, is from here. Uh, she's grown up here in Honolulu and she was a double major actually in global environmental science and in economics an incredibly bright student and really loves to play with data and uh, make some great visualizations. She did some wonderful work with us looking at uh, energy demand nationally, electricity demand nationally, trying to think about how much of uh, electricity demand we can shift to different times of the day uh, to, to help manage uh, integration of renewables on a very large scale. And I think that's some really, really interesting work and she, she contributed a lot to that. But um, she wrote her thesis on uh, another really, really interesting topic, but it's very different. It shows her, her versatility. Um, this is, it's really a paper that's more about climate science that I don't know much about, um, but it's related to uh, uh, work that I've done on agriculture, um, li linking you know, climate and weather to agricultural outcomes and we found that there, there could be, there's, there's a real risk. There's a lot of sensitivity to extreme heat uh, for corn and soybean yields in the United States and in many other parts of the world and projecting that out to anticipated warming shows uh, kind of terrifying potential damages that, that were a little bit off the radar screen of crop scientists before we, we started emphasizing them. Um, so uh, one, we haven't really experienced that in the United States though, and a lot of the world has had extreme heat events and some pretty bad crop outcomes, but in maybe the world's biggest bread basket, the corn belt of the United States, we, um, we had really good weather, a lot less extreme heat. And the question is, why is that happening? And some people say it's the crops themselves. So Eleanor dove into this to, to, to look if, if how, how agriculture is influencing the climate. Um, and uh, I think she did some really creative, interesting stuff here. And uh, take it away, Eleanor. Uh, okay, thanks for the introduction, Michael. I'll share my screen. Okay. So um, this is my main question. Can agricultural intensification explain the unexpected cooling of extreme heat in the Midwestern United States? As you can see from this map over here of the United States, this is the maximum temperature anomalies from 2018 to 2019 during the summer. Um, and I'll explain that temperature anomaly definition a bit later, but you can definitely see some cooling or decrease in maximum temperatures around this Corn Belt or Midwestern region, which is where I'm focusing on. Uh, before I start, I'd like to add, um, say some of my acknowledgements. Thank you to my mentor, Dr. Roberts, for his guidance, um, graduate student CC Zhang, my friends and family, and Gia Sohana for their support. Um, and I'd also like to thank my reviewers for providing feedback and um, some good discussion points for my presentation. Um, additional thank you to Europe for funding part of the project and UHHBC for um, providing the computing power needed to run this. So, as you know, um, we expect global warming to increase temperatures across the globe, which includes increasing summer maximum temperatures, um, but we're not necessarily seeing that in the Midwestern United States. This is a graph by Robertson Schlenker in 2011, looking at the cumulative degrees above 29 degrees Celsius um, for the summer season, um, all mean, mean um, centered. And so you can see that we're expecting to have these values increase all the way to this dotted line where we expect to see um, the values at the end of the century under a slow warming scenario, but we're actually seeing the opposite, so a decrease. And um, this good weather is nice for the crops. It has been well shown that um, corn yields 
decrease um, with uh, an increase in extreme heat events. And so this cooling temperatures in the Midwestern United States has been identified as the warming hole. In 2018, Partridge et al. Um, looked at actually the differences in location depending on seasonality. So focusing in on the summer months, June, July, August, we can see that the warming hole is most present over the um, Midwestern United States or the Corn Belt region. And the cause of this warming hole is not um, certain. And there has been discussion of aerosols and um, general moisture convergence in the Great Plains area or um, ocean atmosphere oscillations. So it's generally um, concluded that it is a factor of multiple, it, it is the effect of multiple factors possibly interacting with each other to create this warming hole. And um, you should also note that there are slight differences in the location of the warming hole depending on the study so um, what periods they're looking at, um, different weather data sets and different temperature analysis methods. So in 2016, Mueller et al. looked at um, the 95th percentile maximum temperatures in um, the summer and compared them to the trends of productivity and hypothesized um, that agriculture could impact the climate and create the warming hole. And um, they found significant results. So this is their graph and they're showing the NPP net primary productivity um, with a negative correlation to the temperature trends, um, decadal temperature trends. And in 2019, Nikeel and Al Tahir um, looked at model simulations comparing two periods and found significant effects of the agriculture and sea surface temperature trends against the temperature and precipitation trends. And um, they also found significant events. So the process or how this all works is evapotranspiration. So agriculture it could possibly cool the environment um, because crops evapotranspirate. So that's a part of the water cycle and part of the energy balance. Um, evapotranspiration is a sum of the evaporation from bodies of water or directly from soil and transpiration, which is um, water uptake from the roots and eventual evaporation from the leaves. So, um, so these past studies look at the general trends of the temperature and compare them with the general trends of agriculture intensification. Um, but what if we could look at the, at the effects of crops without looking at general trends? Um, because correlation does not mean causation. Um, and we know that farmers do, um, we know that farmers do um, shift their planting dates and not in a linear way. So um, we know that they do plant in, in different times of the year sometimes um, within the summer season. So um, if we could align the shifts in maximum temperatures with the shifts in um, the planting dates, then we would be able to see the true effects of um, crops on the climate. So we know that evapotranspiration occurs um, in plants at different rates. Um, the greatest rate is during the middle of the crop growth period. And so for corn, um, I choose R1 period, which is corn silking. And for soy, I choose the R3 growth period, which is the pod setting. Um, and I just choose these because that is the data that's most available to me um, through the USDA. So during these peak evapotranspiration times, um, we should see a decrease in maximum temperatures or cooling of the surface. So for my um, independent variable, I take the day of the year that 50% of the state has reached or passed this peak evapotranspiration period. And um, this is a spread of the day of the years from 1981 to 2019. So you can see that they are planted at different days. Um, and I set that at the center of my peak week zero variable. 
And I also calculate 10 weeks out or 10 sets of seven days out. So I count for 21 weeks within the year um, where, and we should see the least amount of effect from crop evapotranspiration during week negative 10 and week positive 10. I also do this for soy, for both corn and soy. And so for my dependent variable, I'm looking at temperature anomalies. So I take the temperature, the maximum temperature for every single day of the year, and I subtract the mean temp maximum temperature for that specific day of the year um, in that specific location. So I have grids, um, two by two mile grids, um, and I, I subtract that. So I'm obtaining a temperature anomaly. This is just a graph of the maximum, minimum, and precipitation anomaly values for each of the Corn Belt states, which is uh, the, the which are the states that I'm focusing my study on. So um, with obtaining that anomaly, I'm really taking care of any possible misleading trends from seasonality and um, differences in location. This is my regression. So as I previously described, my dependent variable is states weighted, um, states aggregated levels, what aggregated at the state level, weather, um, and I actually throw out the grids that have less than 1% of total state and total grid area devoted to corn or soy um, cultivation. And then on my right hand side, I have my independent variables or um, my peak week variables as dummy variables. So I have 21 dummy variables um, and I interact that with the um, share of crop. So share of corn or share of soy. Um, and that, yeah. And um, I also account for the location and the years and, and the time um, using splines of the Latin long and the year and the week of the year all interacted with each other. So these are my results. Um, I've plotted the coefficients as a sum of the effects of the crop in addition to the um, interaction of the crop and the area. So you can interpret the coefficient as the effect of corn or soy, um, assuming that 100% of the state is devoted to cultivating corn or soy, which is not true for any state, um, but just to give you context. And you can see that um, for corn, we are seeing positive values um, that seem to be peaking around peak week zero, which is um, completely opposite of what we were expecting because we were expecting more negative values around peak week zero where there is supposedly more evapotranspiration. So we're seeing that trend in soy and the values are actually a little bit more significant. So these stars in the middle of the plots um, indicate significance at the 95, 95 confidence. Um, and so that is pretty interesting. I've also clustered the standard errors by year. So they're a little more robust. And um, as you can see, the R squared, which is the fit is conventionally low at 0 0.047. But I do wanna re-emphasize that I've accounted for the um, seasonality and differences in location with my dependent variable, um, which was calculated as an anomaly. So um, this might be um, something to keep in mind. These are a map version of my results. So I just wanted to show something visually. Um, we should see more blue around week zero, uh, which represents more cooling, and also more blue around at these states that have a larger dot, which means it has more, um, more corn or soy cultivation, but we're not necessarily seeing that, especially for the corn. So um, the negative coefficients um, for the soybeans and positive coefficients for corn was definitely surprising for me. I was expecting the coefficients to be relatively similar. And if anything, um, for the corn to be a little more negative than the soy, because we know from existing literature that corn evapotranspirates a little bit more than soy. Um, but there are definitely limitations to this study. So I was utilizing just a simple temperature anomaly calculation um, 
with the subtracting of the mean. And so we may not highlight the warming hole well enough. And um, another limitation is that the peak week calculations are not exactly the single week of the most evapotranspiration. But as I covered before, we should have seen some sort of trend surrounding peak week zero compared to the outer peak week. So peak week negative 10 or positive 10. Um, and the fit by, de by classical definition is low as I previously mentioned, um, but I really do account for seasonality and differences in location, which are both right, um, major explanatory variables for weather variation normally. So um, um, that is something to keep in mind. Um, my last discussion point is that I could be picking up some multicollinearity between corn and soybean with the um, some overlap of the corn and soybean planting dates, um, but in general, soy is planted after corn. So, um, and, and I did also run the regressions um, for corn and soybean separately using the same data. And I found the similar trend that soy had more negative values than corn. So in conclusion, my hypothesis was not, was not supported by my analysis, but it doesn't necessarily mean that agriculture does not affect climate at all. Um, I think my um, results supported the general conclusion that um, the warming hole has been caused by multiple factors. And there are possibly other factors that contribute to warming hole, including complicated interaction between other variables, um, possibly other variables that affect early summer, um, and late summer differently, so perfectly aligning with the earlier planting of corn and later planting of soybean. And um, another possibility is that precipitation, so independently of evapotranspiration, could explain the warming hole clearer, um, or precipitation could actually affect the planting dates, so farmers could possibly get rained out early season. And so that would mean that um, early season weather actually um, would would affect the planting dates or um, my, my independent variable. So that's also something to keep in mind. And so these are all possible points for future exploration. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. That's my bibliography. Thank you, Eleanor. <clears throat> Very good talk. Great job, Everyone. Eleanor. Great job, Eleanor. Congratulations. <laughs> good job, Eleanor. Any questions? Good job, Eleanor. Uh, let's go with uh, Michael Cooney. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, Eleanor, thank you for the job. Um, I had a couple, well, I had a question, and I think it might relate to other variables. Did you consider the reality of like at certain zone, certain times, there's these very high pressure domes that sit over the Midwest in the circulation cells. And those domes, when they sit there, uh, they don't allow, the evapotranspiration actually heats up within the dome and it actually makes um, climate conditions in that region uh, far worse. And in fact, is contributing to um, an increasing statistic or way to die for people to die from heat exposure. So I'm just wondering to what extent did you consider that variable or was that taken into account in this yeah, at all? Uh, yeah, good point. Um, I did not consider that um, at all. Um, I think because I was trying to look at the possibility of um, evapotranspiration in general, um, I, I didn't have a variable to account for when those domes occurred. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't look into that though, but I'll, I'll definitely look into that. Because I, I think um, the difference between high and low pressure zones, which can also create a lot of wind flow, probably mm -hmm. is, is uh, would be useful in the next, to include in, in future studies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely seems very relevant. Thank you. Okay, Eleanor, I have a question to follow up on Mike's comments. Um, the winds blow more or less out of the West over the United States. So wouldn't, wouldn't you expect these effects to show up downwind as opposed to right there? Yeah, um, good question. So I, because I aggregated to the state level, um, 
I wasn't expecting to see any particular major shift. Um, I was thinking of using finer level data um, at the grid level, so two miles by two miles, but that's what I was afraid of, um, the effects of wind and um, possible spillover. So I think when I aggregate at the state level, um, hopefully it should take care of that a little bit. Do you, do you have any idea, Eleanor, how much uh, evaporation all over the earth, you know, from the ocean, from evapotranspiration, the whole works, you know, how much does that affect the temperature, the average temperature of the earth, do you know? Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but I, I do know it's, it's quite a bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was just trying to think, you know, what, what would it be realistic for you to expect to see from agriculture in the Midwest? If you know what the, the whole ball of wax is doing, you know, that might give you a sense of, obviously you're only going to see a fraction of that from agriculture and, you know, what, what logically might you expect to see? I, I, I think it's a, it's a difficult, it's a small signal. And I can imagine that it would be difficult to tease it out. Yeah, I, I was expecting um, quite small effects um, because, well, so, because I was just testing um, one of these hypotheses. So there are other um, studies that look into the oscillations um, and, um, um, aerosols and all that. So I do think that um, the warming hole and the trends that we're seeing are um, a result of multiple of these factors altogether. Okay. Yeah, I, um, very interesting. Uh, presentation. I got a lot of questions. I don't know where to even start, but following up on Dr. Laws's question, if you if you look at, um, for example, like the IPCC reports, you can see that I think the um, latent heat release on a global average is about a quarter of the heat balance. So most of it's incoming short wave balanced by outgoing long wave. And this latent heat release that is evaporation worldwide is about a quarter of that that signal, but I was I was wondering if um, well a couple of things. So first of all, this cooling that you see did there, there's this um, parameter called albedo, which is the amount a surface is reflective, and so something like ice is going to reflect a lot of short wave, and maybe this transition that you're seeing is an albedo effect, and if you have you're replacing brown soil with green vegetation that that might that might contribute to this so that's just a suggestion my question is on the the um on the time series that you're using what's what's the record that you your the total length of record it was back to 1980 is that right so you have um so i actually so my study period is from 1981 until 2019 Okay. Um, but I have temperature data going back to 1900. So that is where I subtract. I, so I gather the mean from 1900 until 2019, discluding 1930s, which was the dust pools. So um, that's what I subtract from. To so, the okay. So, so your anomaly is, is just uh, a, a varying signal and a single mean removed. I'm, yeah, I'm so it's basically it, mean centered. Yeah. If you... Um, you know, there's this parameter that for um, when looking at coral reef health, they have this thing called degree heating weeks. And what they do there is actually look for the times when temperature exceeds the summertime maximum. So instead of subtracting a long-term mean, you subtract a seasonally varying number and then look at that. And that might separate, because because when you showed your first map, you're sitting right in this dip of the Pacific North America pattern, and that thing will change with decadal variability like PDO. So there's a lot of different things going on here at once and trying to tease out what's um, happening now. You have to get to these higher frequency variations as, as well. So I'm wondering if that, um, you know, 
in other words, maybe maybe the seasonal cycle is changing in a very subtle way. And so you're getting a decrease in temperature when in fact the seasonal cycle is changing. And so your maximums are actually increasing. Mm, I, I see what you mean. So um, there were studies um, that were looking at um, actually the Pacific Tejedo Oscillation. And um, he said that or that paper said that um, it, they found significant events and significant effects of that Pacific Decadal Oscillation um, in a negative cycle. But um, they also said that they no longer saw the warming hole um, after, the, after the cycle had switched to positive. Um, and that is not what I observed. So um, as I said before, some of the um, warming hold, like the specific locations and um, the specific um, patterns that they see, like the magnitude of the warming, of the cooling that we see varies a little bit um, with the different weather data sets used and um, the type of analysis that is used. So um, from what I see, it's, um, uh, so yeah, uh, it, that, was, that was a good point. Um, and then I do also want to note that I, actually subtract um, the average temperature according to the day of the year. So the seasonality is removed. Um, but I see what you mean by the long-term decadal trends. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how I would pick that up. Um, but I, I mean, from 1900 to 2019, it's a pretty long average. So if you look at the like a decade, um, Make the mean would probably um, average out from that. Um, yeah. Great. And thanks. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and um, I also do want to mention. So I I do include like a spline of the years. Um, so for um, uh, I include a spline of the years and the week of the year within my regression. So that would kind of um, take care of if there are some shifts within my, within the years that I've studied. Well, Michael, I have another question. Yeah, do you have a question? Another question? Sure. Um, look, uh, maybe a, a, a comment. So. I think Eleanor, you've kind of opened up a rabbit hole. <laughs> the more I, the more I'm a very interesting one. The more I think about it, um, one of the things I mean, what's really ha extreme weather starting to occur because of climate change, the uh, change in the the, sh the nature and the shape of the circulation cells that circle the, the Earth are beginning to change quite significantly as the temperature differential between the North Pole and the equator. Is starting to change non-linearly. So, um, one of the one of the effects that's kind of confusing the lay person sometimes is and this was a couple summers ago. You can have a, a heat wave, a, a, ma a record-breaking heat wave from California to Nevada, but as soon as you go to Colorado, there's uh, snowstorms, and people are having a hard time figuring this out. But it's interesting. It's it's some of those things are occurring because the shape of the um, jet streams, the wobble in the jet streams are becoming so much more pronounced in extreme weather. So I would be very curious to know with this weather patterns you have, these cooling effects, if they're starting to increase in some sort of correlated fashion with some kind of a metric to, to, to measure the, um, the weakening or the strengthening of, of the, or the, or the, the shift of these jet streams because they seem to be stretching or, you know, as we get into warmer, warmer atmosphere. To me, it's sort of like that would be, I think the jet stream shifts could be part of this as well. And I, I agree with you. I don't think it's one thing. I think this is a mat, this is a rabbit hole. It's going to have a lot of variables you're going to have to really statistically tie together. You, know, you chose a pretty big, big question there. I think It's nice. Yeah. Um, there are papers that mention that um, jet streams could possibly be like one of the factors. 
um, but I haven't really looked into any papers that have only focused on the jet stream effects. Any other questions? Hey, I, I have oh, one uh, follow-up. Uh, you know, I don't even remember who said 25%, but that, that seems to be in the ballpark. Anyway, um, it's about 10 degrees Celsius. So the, you know, globally, evaporation of evaporation and condensation of water vapor is, is cooling the earth by, by about 10 degrees. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you everyone. This concludes uh, presentation portion of today's symposium on behalf of the GS program. Thank you for all the speakers, mentors, and attendees. Um, before we go though, um, some of you may be aware that we lost one of our own 2020 graduate, um, Corey Wong, passed away a few weeks ago. Uh, the family's been really appreciative of the outpouring of support from the community. And we have a few pictures from Corey's family and friends that we would like to share. So the, um, the family is keen to record experiences that anyone has with Corey or had with Corey uh, on a memorial board. So I put up a link to the memorial board in the chat window. So if you have any thoughts, comments, uh, experiences, pictures uh, to share with the family, I know that they would be very appreciative. Um, so this concludes our fall 21 GS symposium. Again, thank you for everyone attending. Um, happy holidays and please stay safe. Aloha. <laughs>